What's up, guys? You are listening to the YBR Remo Show, where we talk all things Vancouver real estate and mortgages, take boring topics, and make them interesting. Make sure to stay tuned to listen to everything you need to know how to put cash back in your pocket, create wealth in real estate, and simplify the complicated. Ladies and gentlemen, with us on the show today, and uh, well, I should say we're very excited to have him on the show, is uh, Mr. Robert McLister, who is an editor of MortgageLogic.News, also a mortgage columnist with Globe and Mail. Hopefully I didn't mess that one up, Rob. Appreciate you having having you on the show all the way from Ottawa, is that right? Uh, much more south. I'm in Naples, Florida today. On the other side of the coast, on the other side of the country, exact opposite from us. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time out to join us. That explains the beautiful tan that you've got going on and the rosy cheeks. So Thank makes you. a <laughs> makes I thought a whole it was just because I drink a lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> that could, could be it that too. too. It could be a little bit of a combination. Uh, fantastic. Well, you know, Robert, I really appreciate you hopping on the show here today. Uh, there's a lot of folks who listen to our podcast that may have no idea who the heck you are and and really no understanding as to what kind of value you're going to bring, but we certainly do. And we're certainly excited. So um, Rob, maybe you, if you could take maybe uh, 60 seconds, a minute, two minutes, 10 minutes, however long you want, just to give us a little bit of your backstory on why you're so interested and obsessed with understanding the logic behind the mortgage world and what's happening and what makes you qualified to talk about it. Well, I'm interested in it because it pays well, Um, but more than that, um, it goes way back. We, uh, we got a mortgage, my wife and I, uh, she's woman was it 2004 or something like that. Had a horrible experience with uh, a mortgage broker uh, in Windsor, Ontario, and said to ourselves, you know, we're just coming, we used to be uh, equity traders, and we had a system that worked great, made, you know, did pretty well for ourselves. And then the system stopped working, the market changed. And so we we're still making money, but not, uh, not a lot of money. So we're like, you know, what do we do to kind of uh, open up new opportunities? So we had this bad mortgage experience. And we're like, you know, uh, the internet was coming along back then, 2004. And we're like, you know, how do we uh, digitize this process, make it uh, help people get the information that they need to make better mortgage decisions and, and help them save some steps in the process. So we started a, a mortgage brokerage back then, uh, or not a, a brokerage, but more of a website. Um, it was very early days, very rinky-dink website called myvirtualmortgagebroker.com. Um, we uh, you know, did fairly well, grew it, uh, turned it into a business called Intellimortgage, uh, turned it into a, a business for uh, 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 helping self-directed mortgage borrowers. Uh, and a whole, a, along that, a path there I also started a site called Canadian Mortgage Trends, uh, which uh, covered the Canadian mortgage market. I did that because I needed to learn about mortgages, didn't know anything about mortgages when we first started, and writing about them helped me learn about them. So um, <clears throat> ended up selling Canadian Mortgage Trends to our industry association, uh, started another site called Web uh, Rate Spy, uh, which is a rate comparison website, uh, and ended up selling that. And uh, here I am today, um, still writing about mortgages for the Globe and and for uh, our industry publication, uh, MortgageLogic.News. Well, I think there was a couple of years in between there that a whole bunch of other stuff happened, but that's a pretty interesting backstory. And uh, thousands, I imagine, of articles and columns later, uh, just to give you a little bit more, uh, pump you up a little bit more, uh, you're definitely putting out a great product and a lot of good advice to the people out there. So... Um, Rob is a wizard in the space and knows, uh, like you mentioned, one of the, one of the things that you mentioned there that was massive, which is the fact that you started writing to learn, which is one of the big reasons that we do our content podcast and so forth to learn more about what's going on. So we, uh, we really want to dig deep today. Um, a perfect time for you to come on the show, uh, at a time when the mortgage market is, uh, well, I don't even know what, what, what we, how would you describe the mortgage market? I don't let you describe it. Uh, weak, weaker, much weaker than uh, last year this time. Um, but, uh, you know, it's the cycles, you know, we go up and down, we can't have, uh, you know, uh, 40% uh, volume growth every year. Okay, the uh, mortgage market is is weaker, less growth. Uh, Dean, go ahead. You had a question. There. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, based on, you know, you, you're, you've been writing and obviously educating yourself since 2004, like you mentioned, what out of the cycles you've seen is there any common trends that you're seeing right now leading up to what we think is going to happen with a recession yeah 
um, a bunch of them. So, uh, you know, heading into recession, typically we get an inverted yield curve. and Our, our yield curve is very inverted right now. And, uh, um, you know, to kind of de-jargonize that, it's uh, basically the difference between long-term rates and short-term rates. Normally, <clears throat> long-term rates are, are higher than short-term rates. Um, but when they're inverted, um, it's typically a, a precursor to recession. And we're seeing that now. Um, and, uh, you know, we're seeing credit spreads uh, widen out. And what that means is it's uh, basically the, uh, think of it as the the difference between what <clears throat> a bank pays uh, for funding versus what the government pays for funding. Okay. And that, that gap, is widening, banks are paying more, uh, and that's translating through to mortgage rates. When was the last time that you saw some of these, <clears throat> some of these kind of flags? Would have this been 2008 era? Well, you know, we saw, um, you know, coming into the, the last recession, uh, we saw similar things. Um, things really got hairy back in the global financial crisis. Yeah, you know, 2008-ish. Uh, um, and uh, it's par for the course. You know, when um, uh, rates are shooting up, you got an inflation problem, um, you know, you have... Uh, uh, you know, the economy uh, at risk, you have basically lenders pricing in uh, more credit risk, you have investors who fund the lenders, um, basically, let's think of it as charging the lenders more because there is more risk. Um, so there's similar patterns uh, in every difficult cycle. One thing that kind of stands out to me is when the whole pandemic hit, we saw some pretty quick movement from institutions, we saw lenders start to scale back and they you know, they they took away key programs and they really just tried to tighten up because there was a lot of unknown in the in the future, obviously, um, which is interesting. Seeing what we're seeing now, we're seeing a lot of rate increases, which obviously means there's a lot of risk and, you know, there's recession looming. But we haven't really seen a lot of lenders scale back. We haven't seen lenders take away programs. We've actually seen some lenders come out and, you know, they're extending amortization. It seems like some lenders are actually getting a little bit more creative with this market where it was a totally different mindset when COVID hit. And I think that was probably because COVID was an unknown, right? Yeah, I mean, every lender is different. So, um, you know, it's it's kind of hard to generalize using anecdotes, uh, you know, like we're seeing some, you know, I, I just reported on a few lenders that extended their amortizations 35 and 40 years. Um, and uh, that's happening more and more. Um, you know, if you want to call that a trend, that that's fine. The sample size is small. But, um, you know, the fact is every lender has a playbook. And so, <clears throat> you know, some lenders are pulling back. Uh, some lenders um, are confident in their underwriting procedures. And, you know, they're trying to ramp up business in a shrinking market. Um, market. So, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I would say that generally speaking, um, when you have a down cycle, and you have uh, home prices diving, um, and you know, you're coming into are very likely, uh, it's very likely that you're coming into a recession, then job number one is not to, you know, open the floodgates and do deals left and right, it's to mitigate risk. You know, you you save more for your shareholders when uh, you're avoiding big losses versus uh, incrementing your uh, revenue in a, a shrinking market. So uh, to your point exactly, you mentioned that a small sample size, you have some lenders going to the 35 to 40 year amortizations. And that was uh, part of one of our questions here around um, around le just lender appetite in general. It's, it's, I guess, contrary to what you would think they would be doing right now. Do you think it is purely a market play looking to gain opportunity? Or do you think that those lenders feel like there's still strength in our economy and they're comfortable lending to borrowers because we're going to come out of it quickly. What are your thoughts there? Well, things like the uh, amortization, uh, amortization trend, if you want to call it that, uh, that we're seeing, you know, where you, you have uh, some lenders offering longer amortizations. I mean, <clears throat> that's uh, largely a function of, yeah, number one, obviously, they're trying to drum up a little more business in a in a uh, uh, a market with less opportunities but uh, you also have uh, uh, stress test rates you know uh, around eight percent or above uh, and so to help people qualify and get deals done you know you have to give people a little bit more leash and uh, you know but ultimately uh, everything comes down to underwriting um, you know the rest of it is you know just short-term uh, bad luck and so you know you could 
uh, underwrite uh, a borrower and he could be a rock solid borrower, great job, whatnot, uh, great credit, uh, low debt ratios, whatever. Uh, and then he loses his job. That's not your fault as an underwriter. Um, but uh, in a recession, more people lose their jobs. So, um, you know, there's only so much you can do, but I can tell you and every, all you guys know, um, lenders are careful, right? Nobody wants to stick out, especially regulated lenders, because regulated lenders are under a microscope. You know, regulators uh, compare everyone's uh, arrears rates and um, everyone's under, underwriting quality and no one wants to stick out, you know, uh, and not only for the regulators, but you know, for the investors. Uh, in the business. Uh, so, you know, no one is, I would say virtually no one is is uh, amenable to taking risks, especially when, you know, some markets are are down over 20% uh, real estate value wise in seven months. It's a good point. Interesting. So it's speaking on the, the concept of uh, valuation changing. And so for folks listening to the podcast, there's some people that perhaps don't know um, uh, underwriting as a, as a term, basically it's how a bank looks at your mortgage application and decides whether or not you are a, a approved or not. Like there's obviously a lot more to it, but as a, as a general rule of thumb, it's them looking at the guidelines, making sure that you qualify based on your job and your situation. And there's people called underwriters that are ensuring that is a possibility or making a decision for this bank or this lender. Um, you mentioned right off the, the very end there. So we're going to slide into that. You talked about the, the real estate market, the property values adjusting around. I mean, obviously it's buried depending on which province you're in and which city you're in some way worse than others in this situation, uh, values dipping 20, 25, 30%. Now, um, everybody, I mean, you write about it in your articles. You write about this all the time. There's people predicting this will come back in 2023. The government is saying otherwise. We have some people saying 2024 and and, and beyond. Do you think that if the values continue to uh, dip or stay where they are, at what time period, one year, two years, three years, at what point do you think this could become an issue or a challenge? And um, how should people be thinking about this, if at all? So you're asking if home values uh, dive and then you know stay significantly lower uh, for a long period of time, uh, is that going to have you know like systemic risk? Is that is that what you're saying? More or less, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we've been through this before. <clears throat> uh, you know, late uh, late '80s, early '90s, and into the mid '90s. You know, we had a, a pretty weak real estate market and. Uh, of course, people are more leveraged now, yada, yada. Um, but um, we also have, you know, stricter underwriting guidelines. And, and sorry for using that underwriting word. I, I, I know you told me not to use jargon, but uh, that's okay. Of course, I'll talk about later. Um, but, you know, uh, lenders are, are, I would argue, more careful uh, today than they ever have been. And so uh, home prices stay lower for a while. Yeah, it's got some negative economic impact, obviously. Uh, there's so much of our economy tied to real estate. Um, but, you know, do more people default because of it? Uh, well, I would say that uh, incrementally, perhaps. Um, but, you know, first of all, this is a theoretical discussion. Um, long term, the trend is up, period. Unless something dramatically changes with household formation, you know, the government of Canada decides that uh, maybe letting 450,000 people in our country every year is not a good idea. Um, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, and we're just not building enough homes. You know, CMHC just came out with a report talking about how uh, we just don't have enough uh, people, tradespeople to uh, construct homes at the pace that needs to, you know, we need to see. Uh, to get to affordable, there are affordable housing targets uh, in 2030, and it's it's a significant um, uh, uh, shortage of people to build uh, and construct homes in this country. And you know that's on top of all the other regulatory uh, red tape and whatnot that that goes into even building, getting you know uh, a foundation in for God's sake. So um, long term, the, what I'm trying to say is that long term. Uh, there's a lot of great fundamentals, uh, and that's not changing. Um, yes, we're going to have a recession. It could be a bad one. Don't know. Uh, employment's going to uh, spike further. Uh, people are going to lose their jobs, um, and that's going to push up arrears, like it always does uh, in recessions. Um, and you know, we're just going to have to ride it out. 
That's a good point. I mean, especially the immigration piece. And I'm just curious on your thoughts on this, Robert, based on your experience and seeing what you've seen uh, and all the analytics that you look at, you know, immigration, obviously it's spread throughout the country. And a lot of what we're talking about is nationwide, right? When we talk about like everything that we're talking about today is nationwide. We live in greater Vancouver. You know, there are some hot spots in our country. Uh, and again, I haven't been something, I haven't been through something to this extent. So I'm curious your thoughts on you know, with immigration continuing to move um, and popular areas and popular cities, do you typically see those markets? Obviously, the price points can change a lot more dramatically than you would see in like a Saskatchewan because we saw such a big lift. But would you see the bigger city markets coming back quicker than uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba? Yeah, I mean, if you have to generalize, um, then yes, you know, the downtown core, uh, you know, will probably bounce back quicker in places like Toronto, for example. Yeah. Um, and there's all kinds of economic dynamics happening here, you know, like high rents, you know, people are, you know, there's a, a floor under condos now because, you know, people are uh, not selling as many condos. They're deciding to rent them out. And, you know, you have investors that are going to come in, do a little bottom picking. Uh, and so if you have a strong rental market, which is typically the case in, in a downtown Vancouver or Toronto, <clears throat> then it creates opportunities when prices are down. So, yeah, sure, you could get uh, more of a bounce back. A lot of it has to do with uh, employment opportunities as well, obviously, and those are big employment hubs. Um, so every market's different, you know, like you say. Um, but uh, if you had to generalize, I would say, yeah, you know, where, uh, you know, 80 percent of uh, immigrants are going to three places in the country. And so, you know, those three places benefit from that. And there's only <clears throat> so much uh, capacity to build in high density downtown cores. So, um, yeah. Just a question in regards to like it, people's mindset in our, especially in our industry, realtors and, and, and mortgage brokers, anyone in the finance industry in general, I find kind of get pigeonholed in this idea that a recession is a good thing when rates are going up. They almost think like, Oh, we're, you know, we're looking forward to a recession from the fact that hoping that it's going to make rates plummet in a way. What are your thoughts on that? Like, what are what? How worried do we have to be about a recession? And and it, does that correlate with rates actually going down? Well, uh, you know, you need a bad thing to happen before the good thing happens. So you're going to have to see significant rate increases, and you're going to have to see that recession before you get a rate cut. It would be nicer if you could just have the rate cut and or, or low rates and and have them stay that way and have recession, you know, stay at two percent. But <clears throat> here we are, you know, at this point in the cycle, it is what it is. Um, you know, I wouldn't be rooting for a recession. I wouldn't be rooting for high rates. Uh, you know, I'd be rooting for whatever is uh, best for the economy overall. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, 7% inflation is not the best thing for the economy. I know that, uh, you know, uh, five and a half percent five-year fixed rates, not the best thing for the economy. Um, I don't think that's sustainable. We can't withstand that. You can't grow the economy when people are uh, diverting so much of their discretionary income to their mortgage. So, um, but again, we're in a cycle. It is what it is. I can't fight it. Uh, it's probably, you know, rates are going to get worse before they get better. And, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, every down cycle creates opportunity. Um, and I expect no less this time around. Speaking about uh, cycles and where things are at, we obviously don't know where the bottom is. We don't know where the top is. Everybody's predicting something, but there seems to be this common trend of end of 2023, or if the Bank of Canada has their way, it looks like it'll be three years from now based on the way that they're voicing things. Um, one challenge that even we face on a daily basis, doing what we do, uh, constantly reading data, like information that you're putting out and learning about our clients is advising in these markets and and making suggestions and you know we have you know an incredible base of clients and realtors who call us daily about you know the market and, and talking about it. and we obviously use our best uh, educated advice based on found principles sound principles to help clients but let's talk about this for a quick second right now we we have the tried and true obviously the variable rate discounts were through the roof for the better part of a couple of years and historically speaking it's been a it's been a great opportunity for a lot of clients um, we have, as you mentioned right now, current short-term fixed rates now hovering much above the five-year, which was not the case a month and a half or two months ago. Short-term fixed uh, were, were a great value at that time. And a lot of people suggested, including us, that this was potentially a good play, uh, knowing that rates could come down in a couple of years. I mean, where, where, where is, you're not advising clients anymore, but where's your head at when you're looking at the mortgage market right now from a client perspective, looking at all these different options and solutions, and, and perhaps maybe you could share some feedback on how you're analyzing how someone can make a decision in this changing market. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing is uh, rates are high. They're higher than significantly higher uh, than the five year average. And when that happens, uh, generally you want to be in a shorter term uh, or variable, uh, even if the, the discounts aren't that tremendous. And, um, you know, you can still find, uh, you know, prime minus 90s out there and an insured loan. Um, and, uh, you can still find, you know, one year fixed rates out there in the mid fours. Um, you have to look harder and harder. Um, but for the vast bulk of lenders, uh, what you said is true. You got inversion, not only in the bond market, but in the mortgage rate market. So you got the short terms <clears throat> more expensive than the long terms. And, you know, in, in a way that's too bad. I mean, it'd be nice if you get a, you know, a 4% one year fixed and ride things out for the next 12 months and give yourself some options, um, you know, to, to hopefully get a, a, price, a variable or, or maybe even renew into another one year fixed um, 12 months from now. Um, but that's becoming harder and harder. And when you're making a term decision uh, on which you know, mortgage term to choose, you know, you got to look at everything uh, in the moment. And so it's very difficult uh, to predict what's going to happen, you know, uh, three months from now, let alone a year from now or, or five years from now. And so, you know, you're looking at the rate differentials today, um, and that's factoring in your decision because uh, obviously the the more you pay, the the less um, you know relative to another term, uh, the less likely you are uh, other things equal to outperform that other term. So, you know, you're looking at uh, you know if you can find uh, a one year fix, for example, uh, and this assumes you're a well qualified risk tolerant borrower then uh, you know, maybe that's a, a reasonable play knowing that the Bank of Canada uh, or the market's pricing in another you know, 75 plus basis points uh, of increases from the Bank of Canada and knowing that central bankers uh, are in no rush uh, to pivot and uh, take rates back down. So you know, we might have that uh, plateau for uh, who knows, you know, three months, six months, 12 months, maybe longer, uh, where rates just stay elevated. And so, but a one year fixed uh, puts you in a good spot, I think 12 months from now, uh, by that time, we'll have more information. Uh, you know, the odds are that uh, inflation will be uh, headed in the right direction. Um, and so, uh, where it gets tougher is uh, the folks where, you know, you, you have much less ability to absorb additional rate shocks. And, you know, there's an argument that could be made that maybe those people shouldn't be buying a house at all. Maybe they should be renting at this point. And, uh, and that's tough because we all know how uh, exorbitant uh, rents are in some places all of a sudden. So, um, but uh, those folks, maybe they can't take the, you know, the risk of a one year, maybe they have to look at like a three year uh, fixed instead. Um, maybe they have to, in some cases, look at a, a five-year fixed or a hybrid. Uh, totally depends on, you know, your five-year plan. That's a, yeah, that's well said and well played. Personal circumstances are always going to play a big part in any product, which is, again, why advice on this is so extremely important. Thanks for sharing that. And it's a conversation, Rob, that even the three partners and I had last night. We sit down for an hour and talk about how are we advising ourselves? You know, um, I'm in a variable rate market mortgage myself and sitting there saying, okay, how am I advising myself in this current moment? <laughs> and how do I feel about that? Um, I, I do want to talk about something from a positive vein. Um, uh, and you published this in your article uh, yesterday and you shared a, a trend map and I love trend maps because it helps everybody stay on track. Um, I've seen a few of them lately published, uh, both in the mortgage volume perspective, uh, house price perspective. And it's quite interesting to suggest that perhaps if you just completely stripped out 2021, which is impossible, but if you did, uh, we're still generally speaking on a relatively straight or, or positive trend when it comes to real estate prices and otherwise. The one that I'm referring to shows real home prices in Canada from BMO. Now, this trend map shows real estate prices consistently inclining or increasing as a Canada as a whole uh, and just shows the outliers. Uh, I guess my question to you, to be more specific, is um, should a home buyer right now, somebody who's on the market or thinking about buying in this market, looking to take advantage of where prices are at, should should this be someone who's watching a map like this and feeling good about buying right now because we're still in the upward trend or should someone looking at this say you know what we could still see things going down and i'm going to wait till this trend map, ha map happens because there's a lot of that question going on right now or basically waiting for the bottom so to speak yeah yeah there's a ton of latent demand out there uh that's just going to rip once the central banks uh signal that uh, they're done 
hike in rates. So, uh, or, or once and or once the market signals that, um, and you'll see that you'll see that uh, signaling uh, by way of uh, overnight index swaps and some other things that uh, you know professionals use to um, uh, predict, try to predict where rates are going. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people on the sidelines waiting. And uh, is it a right time to get in right now? Uh, it totally depends on the individual's plan. If your plan is, you know, um, to buy a place and uh, maybe sell it. Uh, in a year, uh, maybe you're better off renting. Uh, if your plan is to uh, be in your place for at least five plus years, then and you're you know you're suited to home ownership and you're well qualified and you know you you, you know you're not going to get hurt if uh, you know you have that. Uh, 98.8 percent loan to value mortgage uh, turns into a uh, 120 percent loan to value mortgage uh, then you can uh, get into that home just remember that um, you know if you know especially for insured borrowers uh, if you get underwater you know you owe more than the home is worth um, you know you're probably going to be uh, stuck in that home for a while um, because uh, you can't pay out the mortgage um, so it's all again like everything in mortgages and, and mortgage decision making borrow dependent yeah i mean i think a big piece that people forget about too is if we look at the market that we just dealt with for two years and it ended six months ago we were like you had to look at a property on a thursday and write an offer on a friday morning subject free tons of risk tons and tons and tons of risk and right now in a buyer's market as much as there's risk of property values continuing to decline and rates are a little bit higher you take the risk out of that, right? Like you can get a two week subject period on a lot of properties. You can take your time, do your due diligence. And you know, if we're jumping on a podcast here talking about we hit the bottom, it's gonna be too late because we're gonna be dealing with that craziness again. And a lot of people are gonna miss out on that because they won't be able to get a property, right? So like there's some value in, in the market that we're in as much as we're probably gonna see it continue to decline for a bit. You gotta think about your situation because we had clients that tried to buy homes for two years and they just couldn't because they weren't in a position to go subject free, right? So. For those types of people, now is the opportunity to to make a move, in my opinion, or relatively soon. Yeah, again, depends on the borrower and the market. Um, but uh, you know, like you guys are talking about, the long term trend is up. Uh, home values generally beat inflation, uh, sometimes by a lot, sometimes by you know maybe one percent. Uh, but um, again, if you're if you're a long term a uh, homeowner uh, and you don't plan to you know have to uh, upsize because you're having kids or you don't you know need to to move uh, for job reasons you're just you know you're a stable home buyer uh, or homeowner then yeah um, I don't see a, a, a tremendous risk buying right now maybe home prices go down another 10 percent or so but um, you know all of us know how fast uh, home prices can rebound. Uh, most of the uh, recent uh, um, reversals have been V-shaped for a reason. Uh, and that is because there's just, uh, people get scared, they overreact, uh, and then the fundamentals kick in again. And um, I don't see much reason to think that's going to change this time around. Now, uh, if you were to tell me that uh, Putin's going to drop a nuclear bomb tomorrow or China's going to uh, invade um, uh, Taiwan, then, you know, some of these answers are going to change. But assuming that the world order, order stays relatively stable, uh, then I think that the long term uh, trend and uh, home appreciation is going to stay stable. That's a great point. Um... Yeah, that's a great point. Well, I'm just going to shift gears a little bit because one of the things that I saw that was really positive for our industry during the pandemic and the boom is we we saw new lenders coming into our market um, or from from the broker channel side of things. So lenders that a mortgage broker could have access to, we saw new lenders uh, you know enter our market, and there was talks that others were coming, but I feel like that talks kind of quieted. Have you found that same or like where, where, where are your thoughts are and do you have much information on like new lenders entering the channel? Um, you know, not not a lot. Uh, I mean, there seems to be a lot of uh, BMO people going to the a big mortgage conference in Vancouver. I don't know what that means, but, um, you know, hopefully we don't lose uh, HSBC um, after, you know, if it uh, decides to sell itself. Um, I guess that would only uh, mainly impact uh, Dominion Lending Center borrowers. Um, 
but uh, you know, new lenders coming in, uh, I don't see a mad rush to get into uh, this type of real estate and mortgage market right now. Yeah, interesting to hear that. But uh, exciting news about BMO and uh, as you mentioned, Tangerine uh, in the past. So we should see some uh, fun stuff come on there. Um, Rob, a couple more quick questions, and then I know you got to fly. So um, we talked about it briefly. You brought it up in in passing. Uh, we actually work with a lot of clients who are who, who like to own real estate as an investment. Uh, we've talked about you know you must be able to hold real estate for the better part of you. Uh, your suggestion was five years. Um, you also suggested people coming into and I, I think I'm quoting you when I say this: scoop up uh, real estate opportunities. Um, so we're starting to get more and more people ask the question: Is now a good time to consider buying a real estate as an investment? And the two things that are stopping people is one, the cost of borrowing, and then two, the fear that. Uh, for whatever reason, rental rates go down. What are your thoughts on someone getting involved in real estate as an investment in this type of climate or market, um, assuming they're well qualified, assuming they have access to the cash and assuming they can buy this home? Do you think there is a good opportunity there? And should they have fears about rental rates changing, going down in a negative manner uh, and or anything else that I haven't talked about? Well, if you buy right, you're not going to lose in real estate long term. Uh, I don't care when you buy, it doesn't matter. Um, but you know, when you buy uh, in a market that's say down, uh, where the media home price is down uh, 20 points uh, in seven months from the peak, uh, then you know you're reducing your risk significantly. So, um, you know, real estate uh, moves in cycles, and so we're in a, a downward cycle right now. But downward cycles end. And this downward cycle is going to end. Um, you know, how long do we stay at the bottom? Who knows? Um, but um, you know, you're getting a better return on investment if uh, rental uh, rates are going up and home prices are going down. That much we know. And if you buy uh, right, meaning you buy in locations that have greater appreciation potential because of positive net migration, because of uh, new employment opportunities because of um you know you whatever um then you have are limiting your risk and so yes uh you know i i, I myself my wife and i are, are are looking at opportunities um uh, to, to pick up a rental property uh in the in the near future now i want to see uh the federal reserve uh, indicate that uh, it's going to take a pause, maybe a long pause, um, because I think a long pause is going to turn into rate cuts. Um, because uh, once they decide uh, to take a pause, it's going to reflect the fact that uh, they're confident that inflation is moving in the right direction, and you know all of the the job losses and slowing economy, and you know all of the. Um, inflation drivers um, that we've seen are, are going to ultimately reverse themselves. You know, we've seen commodity prices come down, we've seen supply chains uh, improve, you know. Um, now the whole, uh, you know, uh, offshoring thing um, and, and the whole uh, global trade uh, question is a concern and that will be a longer term concern. But, um, you know, I think that we're going to see inflation head in the right direction uh, potentially as soon as, uh, you know, first quarter. Wow. Incredible. Wanted but, to hear. Thank you for that. The only, the only thing we got to watch out for is like you mentioned, by the time that we get the good, good news that things have held tight, that, that upward trend is going to hit really, really, really quickly. Uh, and we don't know when exactly that's going to happen. So, uh, yeah, you know, when I, when I was trading stocks, one of my mentors said the good traders is typically early. And the reason is because, um, if you know you're onto a good thing, uh, it's going to be a good thing a year from now. Um, yep. So if you buy it today, um, you avoid the risk of uh, other people front running you. And so yep. I think that you're going to see that, you know, people are smart. Uh, I'm not the only one that knows this stuff. Uh, and so <clears throat> people are going to get into the market and there's going to uh, be a lot of people that are waiting uh, for things to become obvious, the bottom to become obvious. And whenever you do that, uh, almost universally, you're going to be late. Uh, so it's up to you, um, you know, how you want to time your purchase. And, you know, we all know how difficult it is to time anything financial uh, or real estate. Um, but uh, we know what the fundamentals are. 
uh, we know that the the upward rate cycle is going to top out and and reverse at some point. And once you get that reversal uh, and start moving and unemployment uh, tops out, then uh, you know you're going to see home prices lift off like they always do. And they always do. I love that. Great nuggets there. And as you mentioned, not only do you know this, not only do we know this, but we have thankfully hundreds of listeners who also heard and know the same thing. Thanks so much for taking your time out of your day, man. Really appreciate it so much. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, we know you're a busy guy. You're doing this at eight something on the East Coast in Florida. We hope you uh, go and enjoy that beer. And uh, we'll make sure to post up your information. So if anybody wants to follow you or find out more information about you, they can do so. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate you. It was great to be on. Thanks, guys, for having me.